Uh, thank you, John, for the uh, introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer for the kind of uh, invitation for, for me to present uh, today, and especially um, uh, Silvio, Amy, and Alessandra. Right, so um, Alessandra tasked me with uh, um, kind of an introduction lecture, uh, a presentation about um, neuroimaging and how to apply it to, to neuroscience research, really. And um, I hope, and I, I think I won't uh, need to convince the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, pe the people attending that um, neuroimaging uh, imaging is very useful for neuroscience research. And I, I will provide some snapshot of what we've been doing in Manchester for the past few years, um, uh, trying to cover different modalities and show you uh, what, what is possible with, with in vivo imaging. So really, as it was shown in the previous uh, uh, slides, um, imaging is, is quite broad. You can go from cell to, to, to whole organism. And, and really, um, the modality I will present are, are really at the macroscopic uh, end uh, scale of, of the, the imaging modalities with SPECT, uh, MR, and SPECT. So, um, but you will see also that um, the advantage of, of doing that in preclinical model is that we have um, easy access to tissue and in which we can use um, uh, cellular uh, imaging as well to, to kind of confirm the in vivo imaging that we do. So one of the um, topic I've been interested in, in over many years now is neuroinflammation and the role of neuroinflammation in, in brain disease. And at the moment, um, the, still remaining the, the only real biomarker that is uh, broadly used preclinically and clinically is the molecule TSPO, which stands for translocator uh, protein. And it's expressed by microglia when it's active, when microglia are activated. It's mainly expressed in, in uh, at the mitochondrial level in microglia and really reflect the activation of the microglia, um, mostly in a pro-inflammatory phenotype, but it can also remain in an anti-inflammatory phenotype. So in a sense, it's more a marker of activation in the sense of metabolic activation, um, meaning the microglia need to produce uh, cytokine, chemokine, and so on. <clears throat> so it's not, it's, it's a kind of byproduct of, of neuroinflammation, but not really involved in the inflammatory response itself. So in that sense, we are still missing that kind of biomarker. And for example, PET tracer for uh, other biomarker that really are reflecting neuroinflammation. So why initially people were interested in TSPO? Um, because clearly in, in many uh, animal model and, and later in, in um, uh, human tissue or in, in patient with uh, PET imaging, there was a clear link between neuronal insult and expression of TSPO. So the idea was to use that biomarker for diagnostic and follow-up of treatment. And that's where uh, PET imaging and TSPO ligands came in. <clears throat> So over the years, the um, various tracer had been developed. The, the, the uh, prototypical tracer uh, historically was uh, this one, PK-11195. And it has been used for many uh, years. The only problem it had was a high non-specific binding, which generate quite high non-specific uh, signal, and therefore a poor signal uh, uh, to noise ratio. So uh, later on, so we decided I was involved in the development of second generation TSPO tracer. And this is just a few examples of those. So one of them is uh, called DPA714, and we tested it in a model of stroke. And, and what we could uh, uh, show in that study is that uh, this new tracer had actually a similar uh, uptake uh, specific binding, but it had a lower uh, significantly lower non-specific binding, and therefore we were able to improve the, the signal-to-noise ratio. And we, in partnership with um, GEL scale, we also developed another one, which is called GE180. Um, and this was also tested in a model of stroke, and we could see that both the non-specific and the specific uh, binding were significantly better than the first-generation tracer. We also validated uh, uh, those tracer um, in, in a mild model of neuroinflammation that was induced uh, by neuro, uh, by injection of LPS. And uh, again, we, we, sh we show some gain uh, of this tracer, uh, at least significantly for G180 and, and a, a modest gain for DPS114 that was not significant. Um, but I have to emphasize that this was in a very mild uh, model of neuroinflammation, more like 
the level of inflammation seen in Alzheimer's disease or something like that. So, and I will come on to that later. So overall, the second generation tracer that have been developed over the years um, uh, show a, an improved signal to noise ratio. Um, and and I, I like to see those study uh, at the time at the forefront of preclinical imaging. Um, and, and now they've come, they've become uh, tools that are used in clinical study. And these three tracers overall have been used in over 200 publications and uh, among those 60 are clinical studies. So really the, those tracers make the transition between preclinical use and clinical use. So now they, they are really used in clinical study now. Um, I, I won't go over this uh, clinical study uh, right now uh, for the sake of time, but uh, uh, some very nice study have been produced notably with DPA714. Um, so inter developing such tracer is interesting, but in my view, it is only interesting to answer biological question or, or disease related questions. So I want, I'm particularly interested in, in investigating the role of inflammation and neuroinflammation uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And, and as John mentioned uh, earlier, um, there is some in, uh, interesting investigation about the role of uh, COVID or other infection in triggering or, or increasing neuroinflammation in the brain. And it's particularly relevant for a patient of uh, suffering neurological disease like Alzheimer's disease. So, but actually it's not a new concept. Um, uh, very early on in, in 19th century and early 20th century, uh, even uh, when uh, Alois Alzheimer described uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, they were already seeing some cell that at the time they didn't, wasn't, were not sure what it was, but um, uh, that were actually microglia that were, were activated in Alzheimer's disease. So it, it, it is uh, not fairly new, but it's, what is fairly new is that we can image it in a uh, patient now. So um, the, the only problem with, with neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's disease notably is that it's relatively small. So the level of uh, signal are relatively low, but detectable. And here uh, is just an example of a recent study that was done with uh, the new tracer DPA714. And they could show uh, an increase. So this, uh, this, is, this is shown here on the parametric map um, where all the bright voxel uh, indicate an increase in neuroinflammation in this brain region of Alzheimer patient compared to control. So it is possible and it, it is challenging. So um, um, we also investigate that in a, a preclinical model. And as such, um, some time ago, we, we did carry a longitudinal study in mouse, uh, in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And what we did is image the, the mouse at three different time points. Uh, with PET imaging, with the DPA714 for neuroinflammation, but also with uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy to look at different metabolites. So what we found was that in the cortex and hippocampus, so those regions were pulled together, we could uh, see an increase. So in red are the transgenic animals, so the AD animal. With time, we could see an, a significant increase of neuroinflammation in these animal and a significant difference compared to the wild type control here um, uh, at 18 months of age or so quite late. Uh, in the rest of the brain, we could on, only detect a significant increase in, uh, with time in the transgenic, but as you can see, um, there was also a trend to increase in the wild type animal with age. So the conclusion of that study, uh, at least for the PET imaging, is that brain imaging in mice is challenging due to the really the size of the brain and the number of region of interest you can actually extract uh, with precision uh, accurately uh, from uh, such a small brain. And we could see modest but significant increase at late time point. And what was interesting is that comparing uh, the wild type and transgenic or comparing with age, the amplitude of the response that we see in those kind of model is quite similar to what is seen in, in Alzheimer's patient really. So they are modest increase that are detectable. But what is reassuring is that in that model, the, the level of uh, uh, microglial activation is similar to what is seen in patient. Um, as I said, we also conducted an MRS study. So MRS, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, is not imaging per se, but um, use the MR technique to, to extract the, the level of metabolite in the brain. And um, this is challenging in mice as well um, uh, to, to be able to quantify uh, uh, 
fairly small brain region. And uh, what we could observe was a decrease in N-acetyl aspartate. So N-acetyl aspartate is a metabolite that is supposed uh, to reflect uh, neuronal uh, survival, if you like. So uh, a decrease in the transgenic animal highlighted here in NA uh, denote uh, a potential uh, loss of uh, neuron viability. Not necessarily a loss of neuron themselves, but uh, possibly uh, uh, neuronal function at least. So the conclusion were really that, um, uh, because we also did behavioral observation, um, we observed um, behavioral change before uh, we were able to detect any significant change by the in vivo imaging uh, modalities. However, we had all we because we also confirmed the uh, the uh, in vivo result by ex vivo neuropathological observation, and um, these one uh, were detectable earlier and therefore match what we could see in the behavior. So. The conclusion was that it was quite kind of uh, difficult to image mouse uh, mouse brain, and there potentially a lack of sensitivity due to the the size of the brain. And at the time, that's why we decided to move to larger species and uh, a, a model, a new model. Then uh, I just appeared, which is the uh, transgenic F three four four AD rat, and I'll show you some results we've obtained more recently uh, in this model. So we did a, a study uh, as part of the uh, FP7 uh, in mind grant, and this study is the, the, the result of a collaboration with about uh, uh, seven labs across Europe um, and pulling the, the resource and data from all these labs uh, that took part in the study. So first in Manchester, we did a, a, a PET imaging again for neuroinflammation in rat. And as you can see on the top left here, we were able to draw much uh, smaller and much finer uh, brain region than in mice. So for example, instead of pulling the hippocampus and the cortex, all the cortex together, we are able to split the, the cortex in different parts, like the cingulate cortex, the frontal cortex, temporal, and so on. And the hippocampus, thalamus, uh, and so on, uh, in a much more precise way and with uh, region of interest that are much larger. So basically a single of those uh, ROI is about the same size as the cortex and hippocampus in a mice, in mouse. So that gives you an idea of, of the, 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 what we can achieve in the rat uh, because the, of the, the brain being much larger. And what we were able to, to show is, is already a significant increase at 12 months of age in the hippocampus, which is really one of the regions the most affected by uh, amyloid plaque and so on. And um, this further increase at uh, 18 months, but also we were able to show that in, in the wild type, there is an increase with age. And, and that has been observed in some clinical study. And it seems that neuroinflammation uh, goes up in, even in normal patient, and it goes up in normal rat as well with age. So uh, in, increase in neuroinflammation is a kind of an aging, aging process as well. And we, we saw a similar pattern in, in different regions, even in the thalamus. Um, where we have very little amyloid uh, deposition. So that was also an interesting observation that neuroinflammation um, could also happen uh, kind of independently of the plaque load, because in the thalamus, we have about tenfold less amyloid. So all these data were confirmed by ex vivo measurement, and that's what I uh, was saying earlier in my talk. Uh, here, the advantage of, of performing preclinical studies that we can easily access the, the tissue uh, um, at different time points uh, to do microscopic observations. So using the uh, almost the, the far hand of uh, what we do in vivo with microscopy and observe that at cellular level and we can quantify. So uh, as you can see and on the top, this is the microglial in, uh, activation in red. And you can see that they are arranged in kind of uh, uh, blob, which in fact correspond to where the amyloid deposition and the amyloid plaques are. So the microglia are around that. And it's similar for astrocyte here at the bottom in green. And we the, the, the activated astrocyte are, are grouped around the plaque as well. So with age, we have a significant increase of microglial activation with age. Um, not so much in, in the wild type. What's interesting is that with age, the astrocyte tend to degenerate and decrease with age in the wild type. 
in the control animal. It's also observed in, in the transgenic, but what remains is that at all time point, the transgenic animal are far more astrocyte, activated astrocyte than the uh, control animal. And also there is a trend to decrease with age uh, in, the, in the transgenic as well. Um, uh, the, the transgenic always remain higher. So we have activation of both macroglia and astrocyte. So as part of the uh, uh, collaboration, uh, so on the, on the left, this is uh, quantification of amyloid. And this, this work was done in the University of Tours in France um, uh, by the lab of Sylvie Chalon. And um, they did uh, PET imaging with florbetaben, which is a PET tracer for amyloid that is also used in patient. And, um, there was clearly a, uh, there was a, a significant difference between wild type and transgenic at 18 months, and there was a trend to increase uh, at all time point, but that was only significant at uh, 18 months, and the same in the hippocampus. So quite a late increase, uh, possibly uh, because of the, the the high signal that this kind of this this amyloid tracer provide even in normal animal, but it's the case also in in, in patient as well. The uptake and the non-specific binding is quite high with this type of tracer. And again, this was confirmed um, by ex vivo observation. Here, uh, our image of the amyloid plaque load at different age, and as you can see, it's fairly modest at six months. And it's almost uh, at the maximum at 12 months and further increase at uh, 18 months. Also, there is no difference at between 12 and 18 months in the hippocampus. So um, uh, in the cortex, there is a slight increase. So uh, detection of the plaque was possible ex vivo uh, far earlier than, than with uh, in vivo imaging, but that, that is due to the sensitivity of uh, in vivo imaging being far less than what we can do with microscopy. Uh, but obviously, we, we cannot do that in, uh, in, in vivo. So I would say that this, this technique are really complementary. And uh, we also did uh, tau imaging. Uh, also, at the time, this was the only tracer we had available. And this work was done at the University of uh, Turku, um, uh, at the pet center in Turku. And um, the animal was scanned at different ages, so 15 and 25 months of age. And, and by uh, in vivo uh, pet, we could detect tau accumulation. And this was confirmed by autoradiography. And this work was done uh, by uh, uh, the lab, uh, a lab at UCL. Um, and what we noticed was that the tau accumulation only occur around the uh, uh, A beta deposition. So the A beta is, uh, is shown in green here with theoflavine. And the, in brown is the tau deposition. And you can see that tau deposition mainly occur around the uh, amyloid deposition in neurons. So we have an increase uh, quite late um, by in vivo imaging, but uh, detectable much earlier by uh, uh, ex vivo, as I said, and the tau uh, uh, increase is only at the later, uh, at later time point around 15 months and onward. Um, we also looked uh, ex vivo um, at neuronal loss. Um, um, and what we observe, and also that we didn't observe uh, a global neuronal loss in terms of number of neurons. What we noticed is a loss of neuronal staining here, uh, illustrated by neurochrome staining, where you can see that the, there is a loss of neuro, uh, neurochrome staining exactly at the place where amyloid plaques are, which is that suggests that the amyloid plaques are actually either killing or pushing away the neurons in this, in this uh, space and therefore disturbing uh, potentially the, fun the function of neurons. And um, done also in uh, the University of Tours in France was this imaging of uh, um, alpha-7 nicotinic receptor. And what we observed was um, uh, an increase with age of the level of nicotinic receptor in the nucleus basalis of minor, which is one of the nuclei which express uh, mostly uh, cholinergic neurons. And that, that increase with age uh, was not observed in the transgenic and we end up with the transgenic being lower, significantly lower than the wild type at 18 months of age. Um, this is kind of interesting because a study with the same pet tracer in normal uh, volunteer showed that there was also an increase of alpha-7 uh, nicotinic receptor with age in this uh, uh, cohort of patient, which was a longitudinal study in normal volunteer. And there are also study that looks only at later time point in AD patient compared to control. And what they observe is that the, the AD patient are lower than the control. So 
basically the result at 18 months of age match the uh, clinical study comparing AD patient with control and the study in uh, wild type animal match the study in LC volunteer only. So the hypothesis is that it might be that if we were to do longitudinal study uh, in AD patient, we may already have um, at earlier time point uh, uh, a lack of compensation, if you like, uh, of cholinergic receptor that so that happen in normal or, uh, animal or normal patient to compensate aging, and that does not happen in AD. So this is something that that um, I, I would be very interested in, in investigating further. So as, as I told you, we also did MRS in this uh, rat, and, um, and uh, MRS provide a lot of different molecule and marker in the spectra here that, uh, that we can image. So I will just uh, summarize the main finding. Um, what we see is a, a loss, again, of uh, no, um, N-acetyl aspartate in the hippocampus that was significant in the transgenic animal, uh, which may reflect a, a, less, uh, a loss of uh, neuron viability. Um, we have an increase uh, in taurine in cortex and hippocampus, which is uh, quite interesting because taurine uh, has been shown to uh, 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 promote or enhance neuron survival. So this could be seen as a compensatory mechanism uh, by neurons in the AD model to try to prevent neuronal death or, or neuronal loss. So uh, this is the hypothesis about the increase of taurine here. And we have a decrease in total choline in the hippocampus, but also, uh, as you can see here, in wild type with age. So we're not too sure what uh, the loss of choline may mean, and that needs to be uh, clearly further investigated. And we had also uh, an increase in glutamate in the cortex, which may reflect, again, compensatory mechanisms um, in, in the cortex of AD rat. So uh, a more recent study that is not published yet um, it, that we've did in, in the same strain of rat, uh, because we see early change, we were interested in looking at, at earlier time point. So uh, with the tracer UCBH, uh, which target the synaptic vesicle 2A, that are presynaptic vesicle, we did a study in the same strain of rat to look at synaptic density. So um, usually for PET modeling, uh, like for TSPO imaging, for example, we try to use a region which does not contain the receptor as a reference region uh, to normalize the uptake where we have uptake uh, or to do modeling. Uh, I won't go into detail, but uh, basically we need a region that doesn't express the, uh, the receptor to, to be able this, to do this kind of modeling. But obviously with uh, synapse, that's not possible because there are synapse everywhere in the brain. So we don't have such a region. So I had the idea of using a pre-saturation uh, study where we inject the cold uh, ligands competing with the, the hot ligands and uh, to block the specific binding and therefore uh, generate a region of interest which has no um, uh, specific binding. And in a way, we, we succeed in doing that because the, uh, as you can see here, uh, we had region, so this all different group of animal, the wild type at seven months, uh, and the TG at seven months, the wild type uh, at 15 months and the TG at 15 months. So the, the highest bar are the specific binding and the lower bar are when we block the specific binding. And as you can see, when we don't block, we have specific region where the binding is lower. So for example, the hypothalamus, the pon, the substantia nigra and region where the binding is, is higher. So for example, the thalamus is, is very high or some part of the cortex are very high. What was interesting is that when we block the specific binding, the specific, the, the, the regional difference disappeared. So uh, that was confirming that we truly fully block the specific binding. However, what was interesting was that as you can see, for example, in the 15 months old transgenic, the, the non-specific binding was higher than in the seven months wild type or the seven months transgenic. So it seems that there is an increase in non-specific binding with age. Uh, we're not too sure about why is that. Uh, that has been reported in other studies as well in, and in some uh, animal model, notably from uh, AD. Uh, it could be due to aging and the accumulation of uh, lipophilic compound like lip lipofuscin in the cell, which increase the non-specific binding. And uh, but that was interesting because that reinforced the idea that we needed to measure the non-specific binding in, in 
uh, whole group of animals to be able to normalize in each group for the non-specific binding. And that's what we did. And when we normalized the binding, what we could see, and this is clearly shown here on the uh, PET image at the top left. So if we compare the wild type and the TG, you can clearly see that the binding, the specific binding in the uh, uh, seven months old transgenic is significantly lower than uh, in the wild type uh, at early age. But this uh, uh, significant difference disappear later on at 15 months which it seems the, the wild type uh, getting lower, and we have now a significant difference between the seven and the 15 months old um, uh, uh, wild type. So it seems that with age, uh, the synaptic density also decreases uh, in, in, in the wild type, so that at later time point, the wild type and transgenic are exactly at the same level, or almost at the same level. And we did confirm this by uh, autoradiography, and fortunately, um, uh, we lost some of the tissue of the 15 months old, so we had to rely on older animal and um, more diverse age group. So uh, instead, I did a correlation study. And what we saw is that in the wild type, there is a decrease uh, with age, so the age is on the x-axis. So the binding decrease with age. There is a correlation showing a decrease with age uh, in binding in the wild type, which is not present in the transgenic. So confirming, therefore, the PET result here. Um, and um, what is interesting, again, is that a similar study have, have been done with the same tracer in, in clinical patient, and we see comparable difference between AD patient and um, uh, uh, LC control in, in, in PET study in, in, in AD patient. So to summarize the finding in the, uh, in the transgenic rat, um, um, what we found is that this, this rat a model recapitulate most of the important hallmark of AD. So we have presence of both amyloid and tau, which is increasing with age. We have an increase of neuroinflammation with age. We have late significant difference in acetylcholine uh, receptor uh, density, uh, which match clinical study. Um, we have uh, coincident alteration of neuronal marker, NA and taurine by MRS uh, uh, with the A beta and tau increasing load. And we have synaptic loss early on in this model, which may reflect early alteration of, of synaptic density uh, in this model. However, I, I must mention that we did also a lot of uh, behavioral study. And um, I must mention that this model is not a good model for behavioral study. And we now uh, know why. It's because the Fisher 344 background strain has um, uh, poor eyesight and hearing loss from a fairly early age, 10, 12 months. So obviously, um, this, this is very unfavorable for the, the rat performing in, in behavior test. And um, obviously, uh, as they are blind and, uh, and, and uh, almost deaf, um, that increase their stress when placed in an unknown environment, which make them really unfavorable to perform well in behavioral test. So I think the conclusion of that is that we need to back cross this uh, transgenic animal in a non-albino strain that doesn't uh, suffer from this uh, uh, eyesight loss and hearing loss. So we're now using this model to investigate the impact of peripheral infection, infection in AD pathology. Uh, we've done a study using uh, urinary tract infection, which is quite common in, in elderly people. And the manuscript, is, the manuscript is being prepared. And we're also now running a, a, another study using a pneumonia infection. And I would like to conclude uh, by another application. Uh, again, uh, we are looking at a different aspect of uh, neuroinflammation, which is vac vascular activation. Um, so why image uh, vascular activation? Because it happened in various uh, uh, disease or brain conditions, so in neurodegenerative disease, in vascular pathology, but also in brain tumor. And at the center of this is the expression of cell adhesion molecule, or CAMs, um, that are expressed at, at the, uh, inside the vessel. And this is related to neuroinflammation. So basically neuroinflammation or inflammation will induce the expression of this CAM in, in, the, in the vessel. And this could be used then as a tool to image vascular activation. And this obviously is linked as well with BBB impairment. So why is it important? Because these uh, CAM really contribute to the infiltration of immune cell, uh, uh, which need to go through several uh, process uh, 
which is rolling activation of the, the cell and the vessel, adhesion, locomotion, protrusion, and transmigration through the BBB to uh, reach the uh, uh, parenchyma. So we selected uh, three targets. Uh, P-selectin, because it's important in the rolling interaction of leukocyte at the surface of, uh, uh, of the vessel. ICAM, which is intercellular adhesion molecule one, because it's really important for adhesion and migration of leukocyte. And VCAM one, uh, vascular cell adhesion molecule, which is really important also for ad adhesion and migration of leukocyte. So I won't go through uh, too much detail in, uh, about that, but I'm happy to answer question. Um, um, so to do that, um, we choose to do a very simple model of uh, TNF and trastriatal injection rather than go for a disease model. So this is really not relevant, but what we wanted was to induce a clear expression of this molecule. And we managed to do that. So this is uh, confirmed by uh, immunohistochemistry and microscopy. So this is the, P, uh, the, 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 the side of the brain injected with saline. Uh, or buffer, and we, we can see uh, just the basal expression of uh, ICAM and no expression at all of VCAM. And we can see a strong expression, strong induction of, of ICAM and a strong induction of VCAM by TNF. So how do we image that? The advantage of uh, imaging the interior of the vessel is that we don't need a, a, a tracer that will need to cross the BBB because the target is already inside the vessel, so we don't need to cross the BPB. So we can use larger molecules like antibody fragments or nanobody. So nanobody or antibody uh, made uh, by camelite, uh, like a llama, for example. And we choose, uh, we, uh, that was a collaboration with the University of Brussels. And um, we selected, so they did a, a production uh, immunization of llama and a, an in vitro screen. And out of this, we selected three nanobody per target. So as you can see, the molecular weight of a nanobody is much smaller than an antibody. So in terms of biodistribution and elimination, it's much faster um, than antibody, which can last days in the bloodstream. So that's not ideal for imaging, whereas those uh, are eliminated fairly quickly. The, the affinity as well is, is fairly high in, in the same order, uh, nanomolar than a small molecule. And we can either, uh, uh, label them with technetium for SPECT imaging, and that's what I will uh, briefly present now, or with PET using the lysine residue. So very briefly, uh, we selected, uh, we screened the, the nanobody by, by SPECT because economically that was the, the most affordable modality uh, rather than PET, which was more expensive. We needed far less nanobody uh, uh, for the uh, SPECT uh, radio labeling than for the PET radio labeling. And so we did a screening with, uh, with SPECT, and this is just an uh, illustrative image that we obtained in the rat after injection of TNF. Um, and after screening few animals, we selected the two best uh, um, nanobody, one for VCAM, one for ICAM, and unfortunately we then did not uh, uh, find a good nanobody for P-selectin, so we abandoned that and we just uh, kept going with uh, ICAM and VCAM. So we, we added more animal to uh, the validation uh, process using SPECT. And as you can see, we obtained a very good uh, IPC to contralateral ratio. So the, the injected side with TNF versus the injected side with uh, saline and uh, very high uh, IPC contralateral ratio for the VCAM and the ICAM nanobody, about a more than tenfold increase basically. And then we move to uh, uh, the PET. Um, we confirmed as well that we could use those. Irving, Irving, yes. Just, just a brief note about the time. Yes, OK, I'm, I'm done. It's the last slide. Um, so by PET, we, we did um, confirm that this nanobody uh, returned excellent uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. So uh, just to conclude, so um, uh, SPECT was initially chosen by because it was more uh, faster and more affordable. And uh, we were able to select nanobody for the CAM we, we, we targeted and uh, transfer this to uh, PET image. Um, so this is the take home message. So um, uh, obviously for neuroimaging, we can use a variety of, of in vivo imaging, MR, SPEC, PET. Um, but obviously we can extend that to other fields. And uh, really there is a need to consider the best approach and modality to measure the desired right, uh, readout. Um, not everything is, is uh, uh, possible to image with uh, uh, a single modality. So um, we must think about 
uh, using cross modality. And that's, I think, the value of uh, uh, networks such as Eurobioimaging to, to give access to that. And with that, I would just uh, like to uh, acknowledge all my collaborators uh, in different centers and the funders. Thank you for your attention.